Uh, I spent 23 years at Hope College, and uh, one of the, I guess, piece of advice that I actually listened to early on, Nick Morosis was the head coach down at DePaul University for a long time. I uh, started at Northwestern, uh, and then ended up down there as a head coach for a long time. And what a great guy, great person. Uh, didn't matter if you played for him, but if you just interested in football and interested in talking, he was always open. But the one thing that he said was, you know, typically, not, I know it's not 100%, but typically each year if you get a raise, then just put that away. And instead of spending that time. So I listened, I didn't do that 100% of the time, but I did a lot and it enabled me and my wife to uh, step away a little bit earlier than normal. And uh, so we're going to try something else uh, next year. But uh, football wise, I've had, I mean, I've been very fortunate in my career uh, from an assistant standpoint uh, as far as working. I mean, I worked for Dennis Riccio, which was my defensive coordinator at Augustana College in Illinois. I worked for him for five years. Um, I worked for Dean Krebs for 17 years at Hope, Peter Sturzma for six years at Hope. I've been very fortunate of the people that I've been around, uh, the institutions uh, that I worked for, and the people that I worked with, and the kids that I was able to, to coach along the way and, and be associated with. So uh, as far as ever dreading, never had that any day, it was like, okay, let's go get up and get rolling and, and get things done and, and see what uh, what could you do and, and how can you help and what issues are going to come up that day that you're going to have to work through. So very fortunate that way. I put my contact information up so then that way if you have questions feel free to reach out. Um, I'll help as much as I can. Uh, people help me out along the way and stuff so I'm willing to do that. And then, so we talked about the 3-4. So now, one of the things before I get into it is I want to just pull this up quickly, hopefully quickly. In the last few years, I know you can't see it well, but I'll just give you an idea of it. But what I did was I created a, a workbook for our players and I would go through instead of giving them all the details I would just kind of go through and highlight or just give them uh, just a field diagram or words or whatever so then when we would install they would just basically create their own playbook so I want them to be active learners I didn't want to just sit there and just, okay, read through it because I wanted them to put down words that was going to help them remember what we're trying to get across. Because there's some words that's going to register me that's not going to register to you. But you've got certain terminologies from the past or whatever that you can get, write that down. So then as it works through, then it kind of meshes together, they remember it, and then they come along. So the big thing was to be active learners, so that's what this was all about. And then, every year I adjusted it a little bit, okay, so then that way they would know. Now, I played in an odd front in college, coached an odd front at the very beginning, Switched to an even front, and now finished up with an odd front. So last seven plus years, seven years, I think we've been basically totally odd front. Why? Why the transition from an odd, from an even to an odd at the end was this alignment. Okay, we were not getting the the numbers alignment, the size alignment to be able to compete. 70, 75 plays a game, so that's why. We, I like to rotate and keep guys fresh that way, so instead of just having four guys, I basically thought, okay, you gotta have a minimum six, ideally it would be eight if you're doing an even front. Odd front, 
Okay, six. So you can find six guys. Now, here's the other thing about it is you can move guys. You can adjust within the scheme of a three on what kind of nose. If you've got a smaller nose, then move him. And when I say move him, not only move him to the edge of the center, move him out to the inside of the guard or cross the face of the guard and get him into the B-gap. So those things can work. If you got a bigger guy, well then you can, it all fits into that scheme. So those things, as I switched back to an odd, those were some of the big things that I looked at. Can, how many linemen can we get? And also, what are their capabilities? Then, we even right now, I mean, this past season, we had two noses, different type of guys. Okay? One was a bigger guy, that's not as quick, not as nimble. The other guy was a linebacker, wrestler, he could move. So we kind of had two different type of guys playing nose, and depending on who was in there, also kind of depended on what kind of movements I was doing now. Okay? Uh, the other, what I mean by leverage, okay? When you had a forefront with all these three by, two by twos, all this stuff, and you had, sometimes with coverages, okay, certain coverages, you would lose leverage, okay? And I, what I mean by leverage is to be able to force things back inside and be inside out with those guys. Have somebody be able to force everything back in. We well, can do that of a four, but then also if you get four, uh, two by twos, okay, now you get into four verticals and that creates challenges that way. So you got to pick. And the other thing it did, as far as, and I talked about the movement with the front guys, but when you, in a forefront, you tend to tip your coverages. Or at least what, that's what I found. Okay, they would get you in certain formations where they knew exactly what coverage, who was going to be the force, where the weakness was, so then all this check with me type things would get into play. In an odd front, we get balanced. Okay? You got, you got leverage guys on both sides, you got the two deep guys, and now at the at the end, the two deep guys can shift over to the three by one to give a different look one way or the other. So that's that was the thing. It kind of had a built-in disguise in the odd front. You can just balance everything out and you can bring stuff from the weak side, you can bring stuff from the strong side without really tipping the hand and then also from a coverage standpoint you weren't tipping your hand as much. And the big thing like I said was the leverage. Okay, the leverage. So now, those were the reasons why we went to, or went, I went back to an odd front. And like I said, I was very fortunate that the people that I had, as long as I could be able to defend why doing things, I was able to adjust from an uh, uh, even front to an odd front and do different things that way. So, now, as far as setting the defense, okay? I, I believe even, I mean, even at college, okay, our, I told you right now, our one and two no's were totally different guys, okay? We have tackle and end, okay? Our tackle is going to be to the field, our end is going to be to the boundary over the offensive tackle, okay? They're not going to be the same guys. They're not, their qualities, their characteristics, their abilities, their strengths, their weaknesses, they're all different. So we have wide side personnel and we have boundary personnel. Okay, we don't go right and left. Now, you'll say, well, if you watch this one one year, we had a guy that certain positions where we did go right and left. Well, had one guy that had a bad shoulder, and he could only play on one side, so I did do that. But those are exceptions to it. If they're the best guys still with a one bad shoulder, you can protect them on one side, freaking you do it. Okay? And you roll with it. So, but we have field personnel because it happened this year. Um, James Ross uh, ended up uh, going down and, and uh, being offered at Cincinnati, but he was our linebacker coach. And we had two linebackers, the young guys. And one was very, I mean, the dude was fast, good, 
but he was more of a tunnel vision type of guy. He wasn't open to space very well. And I just said, you know, he's probably going to be better in the boundary than he is going to be in the field because it's less things for him to observe and to comprehend and to process. So that's, again, you've got field personnel. To me, you've got guys that can handle playing in space and operating in space and being able to process what's going to happen or what can happen. And then you have guys that's in the boundary, maybe not as fluid, or there's just going to be less things that's going to happen into the boundary. So that's where the field and the boundary come in. Now, progression, how do we do it? Well, it's easy when the ball's on the hash, okay? Or the plus two, what I want to start, if the ball is two steps away from the hash, it's still a hash call. But when it gets past, plus to me is into the boundary, or into the middle of the field, toward the middle of the field. So if it's hash, plus two, okay, if the ball is two steps into the middle of the field, it's still a hash call. But once it gets inside of that for us, okay, then it becomes a middle call. So then we look at the strength. To me, the strength is passing strength. Where is the greatest passing strength? And then, so that just goes down as far as the greater number of receivers, okay? Now, if it's two by two, is, is the number two on one side a tight end, number two on the other side a skill guy? So they, they have to process that. If everything's even, is the back offset or not? Because sometimes those offensive guys, it's an offensive game, okay? It really is. He didn't show, he didn't show any of the protections where they have the offensive lineman going down and blocking the linebacker five, six yards from the line of scrimmage and then throwing a ball. That happens more than often in college, especially. But anyway, so you have that back that will sometimes line up right behind the guard. Then there's times where he's going to line up on the outside edge of the tackle. So if he's lining up even behind the tackle, he's able to get out into the route extremely fast. So then that's, we look at that as a passing strength if things are all even. But if things are totally equal, okay, we've got two skills on both sides, the back is behind the quarterback, then we look at quarterback's arm, okay, his arm. That, and then that says, if it's right-handed, then we put the wide side people to the left, okay, it becomes a left call. So we go to the strength. So that's the breakdown on how we set the defense. Now, uh, pre-snap situation, okay, alignment-wise, okay, we, the nose is going to be at zero. He should never, ever be lined up wrong. He should never, ever get confused, okay? He's always going to line up head up, okay? Then our tackle ends are going to be in a four, so they're going to be head up the offensive tackles, okay? Our backers are going to be head up the guards, okay? That's how we start off. Now, there are some exceptions to that, especially if we get... Uh, what I call a triple, three skills, okay, spread out to the field. We very, very seldom get them in a boundary, but we will get them sometimes. But again, things in the boundary are so close together anyway, into the field, they can get three skills, so we will walk the will out a little bit. And, and everything, for instance, okay, just kind of summarize this real quick. The end of the tackle, Okay, the end's going to go to the boundary, tackle's going to go to the field. Mike is going to be the inside backer to the boundary, Will's going to be to the field. So that's how we do that. Um, roughly four and a half yards off, ideally is I want to keep them active. Okay? And what I mean by active, I don't want them just to stand there and wait. Okay? I want them to be moving around, not a lot. Okay? They don't have to move around a lot. But just move a little bit so then that way, that guard, that center, that tackle, not sure what the heck they're doing. The other thing about it too is, you're talking about movement. Well, if somebody's moving, it's quicker for them to move when the ball is snapped than if they're just sitting, 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 and the ball is snapped, they're behind. 
So get those guys to move and, and a little bit, and I say a little bit, I mean a yard here or there is what I'm talking about. And the big thing is body position, okay? Coach Wooster talked about body position. I always talk about the idea of just being able to move, bend your knees in a position where you can move any way, forward, back, right, left, without raising your hips or lowering your hips. Everybody's different as far as how they move and what position they can move out of. So I, I've never told guys, hey, you got to bend at this point, you got to be here. You got to figure that out as far as where can I, where do my hips need to be, what's my knee been in order to be able to move right or left. Okay? Our Russian dropper, our, our outside, outside backers, strong safeties, whatever you want to call them, okay? Their alignment is going to be dependent on number two. Wherever number two aligns, that's going to tell them where to align. And if number two is tight, if the number two receiver is tight outside in, then we're going to be on the outside edge of the tight end. And what I mean by the outside edge is, I, I'm, I talk about putting our inside toe on the outside toe one yard off the line of scrimmage. That allows me to be able to knife inside if I'm going, can go outside, or whatever the case may be. It gives them enough time from a reaction. We don't see a ton of tight ends. We're seeing more tight ends now, recently. And I say recently, last couple of years. I mean, there for a while, we wasn't seeing any tight ends. Now it's kind of circled back. So that's the alignment. If number two is split, then he talked about intention, okay? What I liked was the idea if I'm going to split the offensive tackle and I'm going to split the number two receiver and I want to be three yards off the ball and off the line of scrimmage and I want to be looking in. I want those guys to feel threatened. I want them to feel threatened and I'm going to be coming off that edge. I may not come off that edge, but if we're getting both sides that way with two, number two split, now, they've got to figure out what they're going to do. Now, we could end up, if number two's tight on one side, we're up, and then number two split on the other side, and we're off. So it looks like a four-man front, but it's odd, because we're covering up the center. So that's alignment-wise. Now, if we have three to a side, three to a side, where's number two? Is he tight? Or is he split? I don't care what number three is doing. I just need to find out where number two. If two's tight, if two and three are tight, then I'm going to be tight. If two split out, three's tight, all I need to worry about. So that's the alignment standpoint. So that's, uh, and again, the drop's going to be to the boundary, the rush is going to be to the field. Okay? Nickel and drop are the deep guys. Okay? And take a lot of space. So. And again, I, I'll, I'll, on film I'll point out the deep guys. But now, numbering system, I start from the boundary side and work in. So, let's just say we got to the field. Okay. So number or two, three, and then Mike is four, five, well, six, seven, eight. Okay? So numbering system. So we start from the boundary personnel is going to be the lower number. So these guys are equal, but again, N's going to be to the boundary all the time. Mike's going to be with the backers. Mike's going to be to the boundary. So he's going to be the lower number. Drop and rush, drop's going to be the lower number. So, now, one of the things from alignment before we move on also is these splits, these splits are also going to have an impact on their alignment. For instance, we were, we had one team that would friggin' be wide, wide splits. They wanted to friggin' just stretch us and see how far we'd go. And give you a, 
an idea, balls in the middle of the field, they'd have their tackles on the hash. They'd have one tackle on one hash, the other one on the other hash. Bottom line is, they wanted to protect their quarterback. They said, if you're going to stretch with us, there's no way you're going to get to the quarterback. So, what we did was, we moved inside and became four eyes on them. So then that way, they wouldn't stretch and we messed around with the inside a little bit. The opposite, okay, where another team that wanted to get out on the edge, and they would bring their splits a foot or less. Foot or less. So when we, when we, the rule that we used, anything that was going to be two or less feet, then we would play on the outside. We'd line up on the outside in a five. And what we would do, what our numbering system, two, four, two, four, six. Okay? So we'd have a four I, we'd have a five. So that's how we would do it. Four I, five, and then all the way across. Two I, two, three. So what we would do is these guys would adjust depending on what the splits were. Those splits were tight, they were playing a five, would run everything out of the five. Because we have that. We can tag that also. Okay? If there's certain calls that I want just on the where I want them on the inside and four eyes, I tag it and then we move from it. If I want them on the outside, we put them in a fives, and then we, we tag it with five call, and then we run whatever call from it. So that's what we've done with the adjustments. So if there's no tag on it, then they need to look and say, okay, is that split tight or is that split wide? And when I say wide, if it gets over three feet, I mean, if it's pushing four feet, then we're going to, they're going to just line up at a four eye because all they're trying to do is just stretch it. So we're going to make them, okay, think that we'll be inside. And plus, sometimes you put them in that situation just because they're not quick enough that guy's better, he's quicker, and they're getting him cut off. So I'm just going to put him on the inside, and he should be in a position to make that play if he's angling inside. Same thing on the outside. So it depends on what you're seeing and what you want to accomplish. Uh, so now blitzes. So system-wise, okay, go. Go is going to be an outside blitz. It's going to be a CD gap blitz is what go means. Twist. So the go and the twist is going to be for the Russian drops. Okay? So if they hear a go or a twist, that means the Russian drop is going to be the blitz. Go means they're going to be in a C gap. Go wide, they're going to be a D gap. Go, uh, if we say two twist or eight twist, now they're going to be a B gap. So now they're coming into the B gap, and that end or uh, tackle is going to go to the C gap. Strike. Strike is going to be a backer blitz. Okay? Strike is going to be a C gap backer blitz. Plug is going to be a backer B gap blitz. Okay? Chase is going to be a backer A gap blitz. Cross is going to be a dub is going to be a, an A gap, but now the backer is going to cross with the nose to go to the other side. So chase is going to be the same side. So if it's a four chase, it's a four chase, then the nose, he's going away, the backer's going to go into the, his side. If it's a four cross, the nose is going to come to the four side, and the backer's going to go to the opposite, A gap. Okay? So that's what the cross is. Okay? And then we get in, crash is going to be, uh, I'll get into that, but now crash is going to be the combination of either the drop of the mic or the will and the rush. Be a, an A gap and a B gap by those two guys is what the crash is. Okay? So that's blitz wise. Now movements. Okay? Scoop. Okay? So with scoop, that tells the end or the tackle that I'm going to the A gap. Okay? So if we have a, a two, two go scoop, okay? So now a two-go scoop is going to tell the drop he's going to off the edge, and the end is now going down to the A gap. Now, how does he go down to the A gap? It all depends. Can you help me? Sure. 
about there facing this way. You're the guard, okay? And you're just going to go down and help the center to your right. So if I'm going down, go, and he goes down hard, hard, hard. Now I'm just going to come off his back hip and get to the A-gap. I'm not going to cross his face because if I try to cross his face, they win. It just, it, they've just got the advantage, they got the angles, they got the seams, everything else. But if he goes down and helps on the nose, then I'm going to just come off his butt and get to the A-gap that way. But if there's anything other than that, then as I look, I'm looking, my eyes should be on his far number, his far armpit. But if he does anything else that I can cross his face, if he turns out or whatever, now I'm going to come to the inside. I'm crossing his face to get to the A-gap that way. So that's the scoop part. That's the scoop part. Thank you. Scoop nose. Okay, what's scoop nose? Scoop nose now is the same thing, but now we're sending the nose. He's also skipping a gap. So he's going to go to the B gap away. So if we have a two scoop nose, now the nose is going to go to the B gap opposite of the two. Okay? So the end's going to follow him down to the A gap. And the nose is going to work out to the B gap. He's going to work to the B gap the same way that I just showed you. So if that guard comes down, I'm crossing his face. If that guard is going to go out to the offensive tackle and help that way, then I'm coming off his back hip and working to the B gap that way. So I'm going to use his body to take the B gap away and then I'm going to position myself to make a play if, he, if that ball, if I can cut that ball off, okay? That, the outside zone, inside zone, or whatever, you get those guys moving, and that's how we operate on that. Slide protection, I mean, all those kind of things. Face, okay? For me, face is we're taking all three, okay? These three guys are all skipping a gap. Okay, so he, if we had a two face, okay, two go face, okay, so now he's going to work out to the D gap, he's going to work to the B gap, he's going to work to the A gap. So they're all skipping. So they, we got movements, we can do one, we can do two, or we can do all three that way. Now obviously with face is we're getting a lot of an H back or a tight end where we want to get we don't want to get that pin and pull crap, okay? Where they, they block down. Well, he comes down, we're crossing his face, that puts them a little bit of a bind now. Where in the heck are they going to pin? Where are they going to stop and get vertical? What's what they want to do, okay? Now, what G, T, and Y means, okay? If I'm an A gap player, if I'm an A gap player, my responsibility A gap, and I hear the term G, that means I'm attacking the inside of the guard. I'm not worrying about the center, okay? So if I'm an A-gap, if I'm the nose and I hear a G, whatever way, okay, I'm going to attack, get my eyes on that guard, and I'm going to work to his inside hip, okay? Same, and if I'm coming down on a scoop G, I want to get on the inside of the, of the guard and get vertical. So if he would happen to try to reach out to me, I don't want to go all the way down to the center. I want to keep my eyes on that inside shoulder and work. If he comes to me, then I need to get on my inside foot and get my eyes on that inside armpit and work vertical that way. So T is the B gap. If I hear T and I'm in the B gap, then I'm going to work through the inside of the tackle, okay? the inside edge of the tackle. Y is on the inside of the tight end. So if I'm a C gap player, there's a Y call. So again, if I get a tight end that just wants to block down on our attack or end, then I tag a Y to it. So now I go attack him and not worry about the offensive attack. So I want to go attack him, and instead of having that shorter edge, I want to see if I can lengthen that edge and, and work it that way. So those are the movements. Here, I'm going to just briefly hit zone pressures. Anything with a bird is a zone pressure for us. Okay? 
Blue Jay, Falcon, Mallard, Toucan, Hawk, Merlin, Bird, and Finch. Okay, those that tells our guys that we're going to be zone pressure. Zone pressure means we're going to be three deep, three under. We're going to be four under, two deep, two deep, four under, three deep, three under. So we're going to be any time that we call this a bird, then they know it's going to be a zone pressure, and we're going to be in one of those two coverages. Okay, so that's how I work through that. Uh, the formations, okay. So let's jump into some film. So even, so a linebacker, okay, a linebacker can also, I mean, if he's an A-gap player, if he's an A-gap player on four cross, uh, four chase, and we put a G on that, he knows that he's going to work through the inside. His target, his aiming point, his key, is that inside of that offensive guard. So that T's the same way. So they need to understand. So I mean, you saw strike. If we go strike wide, now he's a D-gap player, okay? He's gonna strike, but now with the wide call, that tells him he's gonna be a D-gap, which means he's contain and force. So that's the other thing, and I failed to mention that. From a teaching standpoint, if you're a D-gap player, you're going to be contained and forced. If you're a C-gap player, you're contained. What's the difference between contained and forced? Contained, you're only worried about keeping the quarterback inside. That's all you're worried about. If you're a forced player, you're worried about keeping the ball inside. Okay? So option, then you got the pitch back. Whatever, where, whitest guy, that's how we do it. So we have a forced guy, contained guy. It could be the same. Could be the same. Okay, this call here, okay, is a weak go, okay, weak go. Now, so with the formation, okay, it is going to be from the left. So go is going to be the outside. In this situation, the drop is going to come off that edge. Now, we also have, okay, scoop nose on it. So as we watch, if I can, there we go. Okay, see, let's just watch the left side. So we're coming off that edge. So the aiming point of the drop, and we do what we call blitz drill. Blitz drill is the drop and uh, outside guy. I'm going to come down. My aiming point is going to be working to the outside hip of the offensive tackle. So I can run, but as soon as I get to the hip of the offensive tackle, I want to get my shoulders parallel to the line of scrimmage. So then that way, you get those zone reads and all that other stuff. So especially if the back's on my side. If I'm coming off and the back's on my side, I want to get my eyes to the hip. Once I get to the hip, now I'm going to square up and I'm going to shift my eyes and I'm looking at the hip of the, of the running back. Okay? Because as a quarterback rides that running back. And if you're watching that hip, as it goes, those hands are going to appear. Those hands are going to appear and the ball's either going to be in those hands or the ball is going to be out of the hands. Ball's in the hands or the hands is going to be empty. If the hands are empty, now that allows him the opportunity that, hey, all I have to do is I just got to squeeze, squeeze, squeeze. If that running back leaves, and all of a sudden I see the ball in the hands, now I've got to be in a position to contain and keep the quarterback inside. Because I'm a C-gap player, so if that quarterback pulls it, I need to be able to plant and redirect to keep the quarterback inside. So that is the blitz technique that we talk about, is being able to come down and being able to key, transition your body, to allow you the opportunity. Transition is something big time. When I was doing the strength and conditioning in the offseason, we did a lot of transition stuff in, in the gym floor. And biggest thing is, when my kids were going through playing sports, I mean, had football, basketball, track, uh, football, wrestling, track, uh, had soccer, volleyball, and uh, basketball. The number of times that I would sit in the stands 
and just see kids friggin' just run, 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 and then turn and run backwards. Instead of being able to, okay, I'm in a position where, where's my help? Where's my help? I need to transition to be able to push them toward my help to keep the leverage to keep it inside. So being able to transition from one movement to another <coughs> movement has been very important over the years for me at all positions. Everybody's got different on that. So, now, <clears throat> okay, so now the end, end of the boundary, he's going, he's going to go down to the A gap. Well, the guard pulls, so he stays on the inside of that tackle. That tackle rides him down, but he stays on the inside of that, and he disrupts the running back. Okay? Nose. Okay? As you watch the nose down. You see that set, that guard, the left guard, over here, I mean, he's, he's expecting that nose to be there, so he's there, and our nose cross face to get into that gap. Okay? Now, what that does, we just shift gap. So now this backer knows that, okay, he's going there. I've got this guy coming down. I've got a puller. This is the gap that I'm concerned about right there. Is that A gap away from me? Everything else is secured on this side. And then this backer can just sit and knowing that, okay, this guy, the nose is coming to the B gap. I've got this C gap, so now I can just sit there and flow accordingly. And he's an inside out player. We've got help on the outside. Okay. So that's. There's. We'll just watch it real quickly from this view. So now, the other thing is, too, in this coverage is mainly a robber coverage. Okay? Robber coverage. So. We're going to have the leverage outside of number two. He's going to be my leverage guy five yards up. Okay, so now the ball, okay, right before the ball is snapped, we need him to be on the outside edge of number two and forcing him inside. Now, I gave you the pre-snap alignments. That is ideal, okay? That's ideal. When you have younger inexperienced, I had to be a little more flexible. And what I mean by that is, Hey, some of those guys, they just needed to get in that position earlier, so then we didn't have that threat as long as what I wanted to. But what was the main purpose? What's their main responsibility? We've got to be, have them, when the ball snapped, we need to have them in a position to do their main responsibility so everybody else can do their responsibility. You have ideal situations, but then you've got to adjust. I said there's some guys that can handle playing to the field, playing in space and stuff. Some guys can hold that disguise long and then get out, and it comes down from one, physical, okay, experience, okay, being able to, what that feels like timing-wise, and then two, from a mental standpoint, okay. Some guys can process that, they can move quick and do, they can transition to do the responsibilities. Some guys have to line up and, okay, that's the guy I need to concern about. That's the eyes focus I need to have and be able to do it. So those are little things like that that you have to, that I had to adjust to over the, each season depending on who was playing. And also entries, too. Okay? So, and then our D guy, So our deep guy back here is he's going to split the difference between number two and the offensive tackle to the field, okay, to the wide side. It'll be 11 to 12 yards off. He's keying. So we need to have get a great, okay, <clears throat> reroute by number two. This rush right there, he is not backing out at the snap of the ball, okay. He is going to hunker down five yards, okay, and his goal is to force number two inside. If number two crosses his face, he's going with him. If he crosses his face and turns up, 
he's going to go with it. But once he releases to the inside, he doesn't have to worry about number two. He can see a back that's coming out and leverage that. Or a pass shows and nobody's, that back's not coming out. That number two releases inside, either deep or underneath. Now he's just going to turn and find number one and help. So positioning-wise, he's got to be in a position to force. He needs to be in a position, body-wise, to take away the slant. And then number two, or number three, is force an outside hitch, a wide hitch. Not an inside. I don't want that ball to be thrown to the outside of the receiver. If it comes to the inside, I'm going to be able to tip that ball or get in that position to kind of obstruct the, the line of vision of the receiver and just feel that if I come too far in, I may get smacked before I hit the ball, catch the ball, or as soon as I touch the ball, I'm getting smacked. So that's positioning-wise what we talk about there. One gets to some other things too. So that's movement. Uh, okay, this is like a two by two situation here. Okay, the back's offset, so the strength is going to be to the right. Okay, here. Now, so this is tight, so he's going to be up on the line of scrimmage, or a yard off the line of scrimmage, but he's outside. Okay, he's going to put his inside toe on the outside toe over here. Again, he's going to be on the outside edge. He's going to split the difference between. Now, if number two is tight, in the, in the field, when the ball is snapped, he should be into the A gap. Okay, the deep guy should be in the A gap 10 yards, and he's key in number two. Corners are basically, hey, I may have help by the deep guy, I may not have help. Okay, that's how Robert is. And the whole thing about why <coughs> want these guys, the rush and the drop, either at the line of scrimmage or five yards off, is because then that is going to tell the deep guy, okay? If I'm the deep guy on the split, and if I'm getting my underneath guy rerouting, he's either going to show that he's going to block, his intentions is to block, or his intentions is to go out for a route. So I'm going to stay, basically, I don't want to say flat-footed, because I, I didn't, again, I want them to move a little bit so they just kind of bounce their feet a little bit inside foot forward. So I'm looking at number two. Number two comes off fast and tries to avoid, then, hey, it's going to be a pass. But if he comes off and a yard or two right before the rusher drop on your, per, on your side, he idles down, lowers his hip, then that can trigger me to get up and from a run fit standpoint. I can be an extra guy from a run fit. So that's what the robber coverage is about. Now, here's our next. Yep. So this is a chase wrap. Okay? This is a chase wrap. So we're going to send the backer, and we do it two ways. We time it. Or we show it, okay? He, Coach Wooster talked about that. And again, when those guys show it, we just have them get up and put their front foot, front toe, at the heels of the defensive alignment. They're, they're not even, but they're right behind. They're, they're <coughs> staggered. So then that way, the nose can go, then I can go, or I can go, and the nose can go. Because we do it both ways. Um, again, depending on blocking scheme, depending on run pass, all those combinations. Otherwise, if we're timing it, now it's a situation where, again, I talked about, so we start back, we start, and this is, to me, how timing. I don't want the guys to go up here because they get off balance. If they can just scoot up, scoot up, scoot up, they're always in a position where they can explode and go through, or if all of a sudden they get a hard count, now they've got a break where they can control their body and regain their uh, uh, body position and control. So, but this is a chase wrap. So it's just going to go through and bring. Okay. Uh, and again, there, another one. So now, okay. The first one, the linebacker came through. This one, 
the nose came through. So it's one of those things. We will also, what we call pick, okay? So the linebacker will come down. Come on, can you help me again, please? Yep. Okay. So if you're the center, okay, and I'm the backer over here and got the guard. So if we want to pick, so what we'll do is we'll come down, and what we want to do is we want to ideally, and again, every individual is different. I've talked about having the hand and just hitting the hip that way. Some guys like to just do the shoulder pad, but the whole key is if you're going to do the shoulder pad, you can't get your shoulder pad in front. You've got to work to the side. You got to, because otherwise, you work in front, he drops this leg, drop this leg, drop, drop it back. Now he's got you, it, it defeats. So you, that's why I like the idea of just working the hip. Because now you're pushing that hip away and you're controlling that leg and he can't win. So you just ricochet off and then, then the nose would come around. Thank you. So that's what, that's what we will do the pick also on that. Right. Uh, Got about four minutes, coach. Okay. Here's a strike. Okay. So there's a linebacker. This is. We just uh, six strike, so it goes to the field. Okay, the tackle doesn't do a great job. He should have been on the outside. Okay, of that guard, he overshoots it. it doesn't it? Tell you right now, more, more likely it's going to be the eyes is the problem, and the backer is now going to be the contained. So he's going to work to the outside of the tackle to get it pulled up, and and if we do a good job of eyes, then that tackle would get it pulled up by the backer, then the tackle was on the outside of that guard. Now, here's the thing about it. One of the things, if we were going to get a lot of sprint out, one of the things that I would do is tag T to it. So that what that means now is that tackle, okay, six strike T, so now I'm a B gap player, but I'm not going to mess with the guard. I'm just going to stay on that tackle. So as that tackle steps out, then I'm going to not come in as far. I'm going to readjust and I'm going to work through that inside of that tackle. And that tackle will have to decide, do I turn and pin him? Or do I continue to go out for the linebacker that's striking to the outside? So we're putting him in a little bit of a bind. And we did that also uh, from a run game standpoint, okay, on uh, power stuff. That, that works well on power also. So you can see it from the end zone here. Again, you can see the tackle. See, I mean, here would be a good, so if we were doing a T, then that would have been right in that quarterback's face. Okay. Now, here we're gonna do a strike, and then also we're gonna twist Okay, the edge guy down to the A gap, so he's going to basically do scoop technique down to the A gap, and the nose is going to wrap around. So let's watch it from the end zone. So we can do it both sides. We can change it up that way. Uh, this is the same thing. Oh, okay. Here's, here's an example, okay? We've got three skills to the field. Now the linebacker, okay, what he should, he just needs to sit in at five yards, okay? And what we're doing now, this is a third and nine situation, so again, from a pass standpoint. So what we're doing is doing the same thing. We're going to do a strike, but now to the field, we did back strike, but one of the adjustments that we will do is this. If we have three skills, okay, to the side of the blitzer, we're going to check the other backer, okay? Again, this is a pass situation. So this backer just needs to sit inside. His goal is to make number three go deep and over the top or go shallow underneath. One or the other, okay? One or the other. So he just needs to sit in there and be patient and take that window away. We want to take that quick hitch 
by number three away, okay, with his alignment. Because now we have three on two with these guys out here, okay, and this guy is cross keying right there. So what we want to do is sit inside, and once he goes outside and past, he's got it. Now, if he goes underneath, now he can just level off and just kind of see, okay, does he go underneath, then vertical, or does he go shallow all the way across? Because we still got a guy sitting over there in the, in the other flat that he can run to. So he can just mirror him. If he goes underneath, he can just mirror him and kind of see what's going on. If he goes to the outside, we still got another guy that's going to be out there that he can push it to and just help in that void, that curl area. So that's what his job is. And I put this on there. So, I mean, it's, it's incomplete, but see it from the end zone here. So if this linebacker just sits right in there at five yards, okay, forces 15 to go outside and over the top, this guy, so we're going to have, we're going to have him bracket. We're going to have an inside underneath, and then we're going to have an over the top. So that's going to be a, a tougher throw. And then the other thing, too, is we have a strike, and we also have the tackle coming in and the nose coming around. So again, so we've got a, not a clear window, kind of a, what I call a foggy window, because Hey, we've got a guy that's in his face, and he's got to throw that. But if we can get me in there, maybe an interception, or he doesn't throw it at all, and he just takes the sack. Okay? So that's, that's one there. Uh, okay. Weak check. So, now, we talked about a, a chase wrap. The opposite for us of the chase wrap is a nose back chase, okay? So what that is, is now the nose is going to go back because on inside zone, okay, inside zone, you have everybody working, okay, hard, most of the time working hard away. So what we're going to do is now we're getting more of the backs that's going to work, but then they're going to come back to that side because they want to just wash everybody and basically get a straight downhill run from the running back. So the running back is going to make the one, two steps, and then once he gets the ball, he's just going to straight up where the ball was snapped. So by doing the nose back, what we do is now that slows that line from riding everybody across because now we've got a heavier body at the line of scrimmage coming back against the, their momentum, and then we're going to, the linebacker should run here, and the thing is, this gap right here is really not a threat. They don't want to run there. Okay? They typically want to run here to the back side, so this backer is going to fit as everything's working to them. This backer over here is going to fit into this A gap. This backer is going to fit into this A gap. This nose is going to be back here, and we should have the end in the C gap on that side. Now, we have still another hang player out here. If that gap would open up, he would be in position there to fit if needed. So we should, again, have this guy fit right there. This backer fit inside of 73. And this other linebacker would be working in. You can see him right there. So if we're there, we're pretty well gapped out. So that just... The chase wrap against this is hard because you get a different levels. Where if you get the nose back chase, now we're creating a wall. And that's what we talk about. We want to create a wall at the line of scrimmage. Uh, let's get you another, another thing that we would do. Okay. Here's the other thing we'll do is we will go away scoop plug, okay? So, this is the main back, and we knew that they would do this, okay? They would, this is a receiver, mainly a receiver, they put him in and they'd motion him out. If they kept him in, they kept him in, but this was the main back. 
So the other call, so from a zone standpoint, one of the other things we would do is now we would go away scoop because they're zoning to our right. Again, from a defensive perspective, zoning to the right. And then so our end is going to go to that A gap here. Our nose is going to go to the A gap. This tackle is going to go C gap. This will's got the B gap on this side. And then what we're going to do is we're going to send this backer into the B gap over here. Okay? So it's a scoop plug. Okay? A way scoop plug. And then we still have a hang player out here for the C gap. Now, one of the things, and this is, <clears throat> so as we go, now, we should have been tighter right here and not worried about that tackle because we want to push the ball to the outside, okay? So if I'm plugging, I'm plugging, I'm going to go B1, okay? And when I say B1, I'm talking about if this, if somebody would come in and, and attack that and the quarterback would follow, and if I would have the first open gap, I would be a B1 because somebody out here from a coverage standpoint would be ready to help me on B2. So the same idea there is, so if we bring this guy down and I'm going, I'm going to work B1 knowing that I've got to help outside. I want to force. I'm not a force guy. Okay? I'm a B gap player. So if this guy comes across, I want to force that to the outside. And there's my force guy. And I still have another guy that can help me behind. Okay? So this is just another way. And this is something else from a, a wide split standpoint. where Because we will also, we did the chase wrap. We'll also do a plug wrap, okay, where we blitz the B gap and bring the outside guy to the A gap. So this is just the opposite. So we're going fast, and now we should be attacking right there. <clears throat> you just got a little too wide. Okay? So that's that one. Uh, okay, that's... Okay. Mallard, okay, Mallard. Now we're getting our zone pressure, okay? With our zone pressure with Mallard, Mallard means both inside linebackers are blitzing, okay? Chase, that's telling them they're both going to the A gap. We could go Mallard Chase, we could go Mallard Axe. At Mallard Axe, now they're crossing, okay? So the right backer would go to the left A gap, okay? And then vice versa, okay? The left backer would go to the right A gap. But Chase is, we're just going to work through, and on Fox, okay, we were getting a lot of three by one, okay? Get a ton of three by one. I don't always want to be in a three under three deep against a three by one. So what we will do with that is, we will go ahead and play in a three by one situation. We'll go ahead and play basically a cover two on these two. And then we'll take our deep guy and cross Keen to number three and basically play man on the backside. And then the other guy that's not, which is the drop in this situation, he's just got to be alert and be in a position to cover the back. Now, if the back flares out this way, he's flaring out to a zone, cover two. If the back comes this way, he just matches up to a man. If he steps up in, then he just matches up and mans up. So the corner on the weak side, is manned up and then we zone it. So, but if it's a two by two situation, we're just going to play four under two deep. Is what we're going to play. So we can go four under two deep. We can go three under three deep. We can also box it and get the combination of a man on one side and a zone on the strong side. Okay. So that's what box is. Ah. Uh, let's go to. So this was typed. So that tells when it's the the direction tells where the nose is going. So type. So this would be a right call. So the nose is going to the right B gap, and then the backers are going to go to the A gap. Okay. <coughs> hey, it doesn't always work well, but that's that's the idea. Depending here, here's a run situation. Ooh, what's going on? Okay. So let's go back formation wise. So it's basically a two by two. We'll just say two by two. We got two over here, two there, and the back. 
So we're just going to play 400 too deep. Okay, motion's in still. So we got the corner to be the force guy. Okay, here to the boundary. Does a great job. Okay, does a great job over here. So this is, okay, an away. Okay. So now the nose is going to go away from the back, okay, which is a right call because the back is offset to the left because <coughs> certain tendencies and stuff like that. This was game two, so you didn't have great tendencies, but that's what we did. Now, so it's a, again, it's a chase. So the backers are running through the A gaps, okay, and then you've got the force by the corner to the left, and then you have the deep guy should have been out a little bit wider than would fit right inside. That's uh, one of the zone pressures. Uh, okay, Hawk. Hawk, I like better against run or pass. Doesn't matter. And here's the reason why. Is because now, like on the Mallard, it's predetermined. Okay, on Hawk, what we're doing is, so this is back Hawk. So we should have the nose working to the a gap to the side of the back. The backer on the side of the back is going to go to the opposite A gap. The backer away from the back is going to key the guard. So if the guard steps down, that's his green light to go through the B gap. If that guard steps out, he's going to work back to the other B gap. Okay? From a runner pass standpoint, it's one, it's okay, where's the back fitting in? The slide protection that he talked about, well, instead of attacking, uh, having a backer attack the guard in that V-gap, well, let him just slide that way, and then let's go around to the other side, and let's make the back that they don't want to block, or the back is in the backfield to run the ball or catch the ball. He's not a primary blocker. Now, they do sub and get a primary blocker in there, and then he's not going to run or pass, but... What we want to do is force the back to block, okay, to pass protect. So that's where, that's where we like to hop. So across. So now, so the nose fits in that A gap, and that backer is in the other A gap. And again, even though the back's going that way, the ball's going that way, it's really not a threat, but anyway, we do have somebody that can help us out here in this B gap if necessary. Okay, but now let's watch the backer away from the back. Okay, that guard goes out, so now he's looking to go back to the back side. So you can see, see right now, okay, we got gapped out almost, but at least we got a nose in this gap. And we're here, okay, and we're solid. So that guy's not going to come all the way back here because now what the lineman will do, okay, most offenses, okay, I'm not going to say all, but most offenses, when you're looking at a zone situation, one of the guards is basically going to take a gap away. So now let's use their body and their scheme against them and force it back. So we can get by with a fewer number of guys in those areas by working against their blocking scheme. 